Welcome back to Unveiling the Covenants, where we explore the mysteries of sacred scripture and the covenant love of God the Father from the heart of the church. I'm Marcus Peter. We're talking about the book of First Corinthians today. The first letter to the Corinthians is one of those letters that's undisputed in terms of its Pauline authorship. Some of the other letters, scholars are still debating whether Paul wrote them. I wouldn't put too much stock into these scholarly debates for this one reason. We can trust in sacred tradition and in the, the divine magisterium. We can trust in the fact that if the church teaches this, it is because inherently the Holy Spirit is inspiring her to teach this. So we hold that the Pauline epistles are ascribed to the hand of Paul, and therefore we can trust that Paul wrote them. The letter to the Hebrews is still debated in terms of its penmanship. We might probably never know, but there is a tradition, and one of the strongest proponents of this was St. Thomas Aquinas. He argued that Paul was the author of the letter to the Hebrews. And you'll notice that in some canons, Hebrews is bundled into the category of Pauline authors, the Pauline letters. You're, you're, you're free to believe whether uh, that Paul wrote it or not. Regardless of the situation, it is an inspired work of the Holy Spirit, and that's most important. So why did Paul write to the Corinthians? Well, Corinth was a bustling cosmopolitan Greek city. And as with all cosmopolitan cities, especially in pagan Greece, it wasn't known for its great virtues. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, on the one hand, it was a center of government. It was also a center of commerce. In fact, Corinth was one of those areas where many people from the entirety of the Roman Empire would go to trade. And unfortunately, now this included people like uh, military men, businessmen, merchants, sailors, and they came from all, all parts of the Roman Empire and beyond. Now, because of that, it was a place of true entertainment. There were many sporting arenas in Corinth. It was also the home of, uh, for want of a better expression, it was the home of particular pagan cults that had temple prostitutes. It was the home of a lot of practice of licentious sex. And that's a problem because by the time the Christian revelation enters Corinth, the Christians in Corinth have to now live in a manner that is worthy of their Christian call. And therefore, they have to reject the wiles of their entire culture. There were certain phrases, for example, to live like a Corinthian. There was this phrase in Greek, it was a Corinthiazen, to, to live like a Corinthian or to be a Corinthian. What was this phrase throughout the, the Grecian part of the empire, of the Roman Empire, that, that meant to live a licentious life, to live a dissolute life, a life of immorality. That was Corinth. But secondly, to call a woman, for example, a Corinthian girl, was a euphemism for the fact that she was a woman of loose morals. That was Corinth. That's the Corinth that Paul is writing to. And he's writing to the Christians who live in Corinth, and he's exhorting them. And the reason why he's exhorting them is because this was a community of Jewish and Gentile converts. So pagans had converted into Catholicism. And in this letter, Paul is trying to exhort them to not fall into the disorders of the entire culture and the entire society. He tells them of the message of the cross toward the beginning of the book. He tells them of how their church has, is exemplary in some ways. However, he also chides, the, chides them for their spiritual childishness. He exhorts the preachers of the gospel in Corinth. And then he criticizes a particular man whom he's discovered has married his father's wife, his stepmother. And Paul effectively says, cast out the evildoer from among you. Paul condemns their sexual sins in chapter 6, and then he goes on to talk about the beauty of marriage and its duties on virginity. In fact, this is one of those epistles where we will discover that Paul challenges the faithful, some of the faithful, to embrace lives of celibate, consecrated lives for the sake of the gospel. He, he doesn't deny marriage and its goods, but he does say that there is a certain dignity and sacredness to consecrating one's life to the work of the gospel. And then after that, you go on to particular areas that we will talk about in a bit. 
The entire premise of the letter to the Corinthians is to challenge this church to not be conformed to what's going on in their culture. Much like the letter to the Romans, but it goes a little deeper. He wants to challenge them into God's will. He thanks God for them. He proclaims Christ crucified. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23 is where we get that beautiful phrase. And so we proclaim Christ crucified, a message that is blasphemous to the Jews and a stumbling block to the Gentiles. But for those of us who believe, it's the power and wisdom of God. Why? Because God chose to destroy the wisdom of the wise. And Paul wants people to know this because in Corinth, this great hub of the Greeks, is also one of the centers of learning. So a lot of the great philosophical works and studies were done in Corinth. And so the temptation is to want to start believing that because of one's learnedness, one possesses the wisdom necessary to live a good life. On a natural level, that's true. But Paul is trying to exhort us to realize that the gospel message compels us to a far greater reality than that. And so Paul says this, let anyone who wants to boast, don't boast about his intellect, don't boast about his achievements, don't boast about his money, because Corinth is a very wealthy city. Don't boast about his athletic achievements, boast about none of that. If anyone wants to boast, let him boast about the Lord. Let him boast about Adonai. So Paul then says this, as for me, brothers, when I arrived among you, it was not with surpassing eloquence or wisdom that I came announcing to you the concealed truth about God. I had decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Christ the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, and even him only as someone who had died, who had been executed as a criminal. Because at the end of the day, Christ crucified is the gospel message that saves us. You move on into the letter and you see Paul bearing his fatherly heart to them. Who can know the mind of the Lord? Who can counsel him? But we have been given the mind of who? Christ. So Paul is talking about how the Corinthian church is becoming more and more aware of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in their lives that by the power of grace transforms an individual so that he's not only living a good life by some measure, naturally, he's living a sanctified life at a supernatural level. God gives us that assistance that's more than just assistance, it's divine life itself. God gives us that call that's more than just a vocal call. It is Him pouring His being into us to elevate us, to become able to live as He lives so that we can enjoy eternity as He is eternal. And Paul is trying to exhort the Corinthians to that. And so Paul says this, Let no one fool himself. This is in chapter 3. If someone amongst you thinks he is wise by this world standards, let him become foolish so that he may become really wise. For the wisdom of the world is nonsense, as far as God is concerned. As the scriptures say, and this is in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, he traps the wise in their own cleverness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are worthless. There's no point boasting in any of our achievements. At the end of the day, all of this will be dust. All of this will count for nothing. God alone will count for everything. None of us will be able to take anything that we've done, no matter how good, into eternal life. We will come before the Lord our God with empty hands. We will only merit, merit will have some level of measure in eternity to the effect that we have loved. Our soul's capacity for charity, selfless love, is what will be measured. Why? Because charity is the prime characteristic of God himself. God is love. God is agape, charity, caritas. When we die, we will be measured by our interior capacity to have loved as God loved. And all our work on earth is but an exercise in expanding that capacity. Or to use an analogy put forth by St. Therese of Lisieux, all of us are born with different sized vessels in our hearts for love. She said that she had a thimble. I don't believe that. I believe she had an ocean. But she said she had a thimble. Our task on earth is to expand that vessel within us with this capacity for charity. And the way to do it is selfless love, embracing suffering in the light of selfless love. 
God allows suffering to befall us because it expands our capacity for love and charity if we unite it to the cross and embrace it well. But God is a true father who will never test us beyond what we can handle. So Paul then goes on to say, after all, what makes you so special? What do you have that you didn't receive as a gift? And if in fact it was a gift, why do you boast as if it weren't? Are you glutted already? Are you rich already? You have become kings even though we are not? I thank God for placing us as ministers of the gospel at the tail of the parade, at the end. And then he goes on to say this, like men condemned to die in the public arena, we apostles, we preachers of the gospel, have become a spectacle before the whole universe, before angels as well as men. For the Messiah's sake, we who are preachers are fools, but united with the Messiah, you are wise. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, but we are dishonored. And that is the price to be paid to become a proclaimer of the gospel. Paul was mincing no words here. He is a bishop, one of the early bishops of the church. And he was going around ordaining new bishops, planting these churches, expanding the literal kingdom of Jesus Christ. And he says, what I am counts for nothing. I am but a fool. He calls himself, I was born as, I was called into Christ as one so untimely born. One who was untimely born. He recognizes that he doesn't deserve the calling that's been placed in his life. None of us deserve any of the good that's been given to us. This is gratuitous grace that has been given. And the gratuitousness of our Lord is the reason why we can say we are children of the Father and Christians. Paul was very concerned about the observance of the holy days. And so in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, he talks about the background of the Old Testament Passover. But he talks about how the prophetic fulfillment of this is clear in the person of Jesus Christ. He said that you deal with your moral problems in the light of Jesus' sacrifice, because this is the analogy of the Passover. Your boasting is not good. It takes only a little bit of leaven to leaven the whole batch of dough. Get rid of the old leaven so that you can be a new batch of dough. This is Passover analogy. The Passover bread had to have no leaven. And he's using this analogy because he knows that the Jewish members understand these words. But the new Gentile converts are celebrating in the new Passover when they too understand these words. Because the Eucharistic species of the breaking of the bread of the early church had to be prepared in the way Jesus celebrated it. So what does the species look like? For the bread, it had to be unleavened bread. And for the wine, it had to be very simply the way wine was produced in Israel. It was grapes, sugar, water. There was, there was nothing else, that, and of course the yeast for fermentation. There was nothing else that was added to the Eucharistic species. So when Paul is writing this, he is understanding that they will understand that leaven in bread is a problem when it comes to the liturgy, and therefore it's a problem when it comes to spiritual life. The leaven that he's talking about here is sin. And so our Passover lamb, the Christ, Jesus, has been sacrificed. If a Jew is not converted and he hear, hears these words, for our Passover lamb, the Christ, Jesus, has been sacrificed, they will look at that and go, gasp, how dare you? And yet, that is exactly how bold Paul was in reaffirming this truth to the Corinthians. Not with leftover leaven, the leaven of wickedness and evil, but with the bread of purity and truth. This is Eucharistic language, so don't miss it when you're reading 1 Corinthians. In fact, this entire epistle is very Eucharistic in its conception and in its writing. So the slaying of Jesus Christ as the new and eternal Passover lamb was meant to fulfill what was foreshadowed in the hundreds of thousands of lambs that were slayed for the forgiveness of Israel's sins from the inception of covenant life in Israel. From the point of the fall, every sacrifice that had been offered was offered to the effect of anticipatory faith in Jesus' finished work. So the Old Testament quote-unquote sacraments didn't save it was faith in the work of God that saved. In the New Testament, however, the sacraments actually become channels of grace. 
And grace is God's life poured into you. So in the Old Testament, the debt of sin was reversed. Grace was an external reality. God granted favor to Israel, and they lived to the natural capacity that they could. In the New Testament, Christ paved the way for the Holy Spirit to be poured into our hearts so that now we don't need the Ten Commandments inscribed in stone. The Holy Spirit inscribes it by the power of our conscience in our hearts, or as Aquinas would say, synderesis, in our hearts. This is the great circumcision of the heart. Everything in the Old Testament foreshadowed the fulfillment that was to come in Jesus' finished work. And Paul wants the Israelites to understand this. He wants the Corinthians to understand this. He wants us to understand this. That when you and I go to the Eucharistic sacrifice, we are beholding a brand new sacrifice that is appealing to Jesus' sacrifice 2,000 years ago because that finished event is timeless because God died on the cross. And so what's happening here? is our participation in the crucifixion of Christ time and time and time again. There's a reality in which this sacrifice is a new sacrifice. But on the other hand, this new sacrifice is also hearkening to the age-old sacrifice. And there's a heavenly reality. Christ is offering his once-for-all sacrifice for us from the cross in heaven, in the heavenly sanctuary. That's why the Eucharist is heaven on earth. And Paul highlights that. These spiritual lessons are striking. And if you have these lenses, you can pick them up. This covenant language of Christ as the Passover lamb is not sufficient. Now, the lamb is also the high priest who offers, and he is also the king. And he is the king who will come again. This is the gospel. He is coming in the world to come. And he will not appear this time as the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. He will appear this time as the righteous, triumphant, glorious king of the entire universe. The universe that he has rightly claimed as his own by triumphing upon the cross. In 1 Corinthians 6, you get this whole analogy of the temple. Paul says that you know, with all the biblical holidays, there are spiritual lessons that can be learned. Hanukkah becomes one of those lessons. But what he wants to highlight, however, is the temple is going to be gone. By the time he's writing this, the temple is still there, but the temple is going to be destroyed. And when the temple is destroyed, the old covenant will officially come to an end. Now, this isn't a supersession to negate the blessings of the old covenant. Christ came to fulfill and elevate all of the old covenants. And because this language of elevation and fulfillment is true in Christ, every single covenant beforehand is brought into the new and eternal covenant in Christ, including the covenant promises made to Abraham and the Israelite people, land, kingship, a name, including the Davidic promises made to David of the building of a throne that will be the new Israel, which is now the church. Christ fulfills that, and Paul wants to highlight that. Now, he goes on to say this. This is likened to the mystery of marriage, and that's why he condemns sexual intercourse outside of marriage. This language of the two will become one flesh that we see in Genesis chapter 2 is repeated by Paul here. And he says this. This is in 6 verse 18. Run from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of his body. But he who fornicates sins against his own body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. In Hebrew, the Ruach HaKodesh, the the Holy Spirit, who lives inside you. You have received him from God. The fact is, now there's a kind of There's a kind of incredulousness in the language of the sentence in the Greek. The fact is, you don't belong to yourselves. Or some translations would say, know you not that you are not your own. What Paul is trying to say here is, you already know this, quit making excuses. You don't belong to yourself. The moment you were baptized, you have been bought with the blood of the Lamb for Christ, for the Father. You cannot live, I cannot live as if I am my own. I cannot function as if I am my own. No matter how bad things get, I belong to the Father, who is the God of the universe, who created heaven and earth. I belong to the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I belong to the one who became man 
and who died on the cross for my sins, who is at once high king and high priest, who is at once offering and offerer, who is at once the God of the universe and my beloved, who is at once God and man. I belong to him entirely. And he has cast my sins as far as the east is from the west. Paul is saying you were bought at a price. Use your bodies to glorify God. So he goes on from there to talk about the freedom we have in the life of Christ. He talks about the joy of being members of the body of Christ, as I mentioned earlier, condemning evildoers in the community. But then, then we get chapter 11, and he zooms in to the Eucharistic reality. He talks about this. When you gather together, this is 11 verse 20, when you see the words, the gathering, the breaking of the bread, the assembly, all of these are euphemisms for the one meaning, the Eucharistic liturgy. When you gather together, it is not to eat a meal of the Lord in, 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 in its sense of just being a meal. Because you're already, because as you eat your meal, each one goes ahead on his own so that no one stays hungry while another is already drunk. He is saying, discern the body. Eat and drink your meals at home. Because he says this, For what I received from the Lord, I passed on to you. That the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, this is verse 23, he took bread, and after he had made the barakah, the blessing, he broke it. And he said, This is my body which is for you. Do this as a memor memorial to me, in Greek, anamnesis, to me. Likewise, also the cup after the meal. This cup is the new covenant. Now, the, the, these, this language is crucial. In Greek, the kaine diatheke. Never have these words been used in the entirety of the Bible until Jesus comes along in Luke 22 to establish the new and eternal covenant. And this language is so powerful that Paul repeats it here. This is the new covenant affected by what? My blood. Do this, and as often as you drink it, do it as an anamnesis, a living out, a memory to me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. And so Paul then exhorts us, and I need everyone to pay attention to this. Whoever eats the Lord's bread and drinks the Lord's cup, in other words, eats the Lord's body and drinks the Lord's blood, in an unworthy manner will be guilty of desecrating the body and blood of the Lord. It doesn't get more Eucharistic than that. What does he mean by an unworthy manner? If you and I have cut ourselves off from the life of grace by means of mortal sin, we cannot go forth to receive communion. We have to eat and drink of the body of Christ in a discerning manner. And that discerning manner necessitates that you and I have received sacramental confession worthily and are living in a state of prayerful grace so that we are prepared to receive our Lord in sacramental union. Paul will go on to say that whoever eats and drinks without discerning the body dies. They drink judgment upon themselves because the spiritual death is worse than the physical death that a person endures. Then he moves on to 1 Corinthians 12. He talks about the charismatic gifts. We get the entire list of the nine of them here. I don't want to go into the depths of them. I want to go down to that chapter of twelve, because chapter 12 because he says, but now I will show you the best way of all. After having listed some of these charismatic gifts, they are, some of them are miraculous gifts, he says, but now I will show you the best way of all. And he talks about love, caritas. And in caritas, this agape, he is challenging the Corinthians and you and me to be as Christ is because receiving of the Eucharist compels us to receive more of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit endows us with gifts but, but these gifts are not our own. These gifts are meant to put us at the service of the church but we cannot serve, that's 1 Corinthians 12, we cannot serve until you look at chapter 13 without love. We are called to be selfless. We are called to be at the service of the body. And so Paul challenges us to use all of our gifts, not just the charismatic gifts, but our capacities of teaching and preaching, of administration, of artistry, what, what have you, at the service of the body of Christ at the common good, and do so in love. Many weddings like to pull out 1 Corinthians 13. 
Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love is not boastful, not proud, not rude, not selfish, not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't gloat over people's sins, takes delight in the truth, bears up, always trusts, always hopes, always endures. But notice that when Paul writes about this, he's talking about how our love on earth. Now, love isn't a feeling. It's not an affection. Love means choosing the good of the other over the self. Every day, we wake up and we choose the good of our spouse and our children. There's no such thing as I woke up and I fell out of love with this person. That's garbage. You fall in love by choosing to love the person. Your passions follow suit. Your feelings follow suit. Your affections follow suit. Paul is talking about heavenly glory. We see obscurely now, but we will see face to face one day. And so the book of Corinthians will go on until chapter 16. And he greets in his own handwriting with a blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love is with you all in union with Jesus the Christ. So read the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. And may it transform you as it transformed me the first time I picked it up. Until next time, God bless you and keep you always. I'm Marcus Peter.